So the question is, not only do I grow, but what do I grow in? And what I grow in is what I call the big picture. I think there are four things that allow people to be successful. And I think these four things you've got to be good at. You've got to be good at relationships. In other words, you've got to connect with people. People won't go along with you if they can't get along with you. you just got to be good with relationships. You've got to be good with equipping people. You've got to know how to train and develop people because you can't compound anything in your life unless you get somebody else to do it with you. So all compounding is in training and equipping. You've got to be good in attitude. Because attitude, if it's good, will let you overcome adversity, which everyone has. And if it's bad, it'll let adversity overcome you. And you've got to be good in leadership. You've got to be able to influence more people. Now, I think those four things you just got to be good at, regardless of what your profession is, what your calling is, what your career is. You better be good with relationships. You better be good with equipment. You better be good with attitude. And you better be good with leadership. At 20, age 25, I decided those were the four keys to continuous success in a person's life. And then, when I started writing books, I said, I'll write about those four things all the time. If it's a John Maxwell book, it's in those areas right there. Because that's the key to people's success. What keeps people buying my books is I'm constantly writing about something that will make them better. And it works for them. Now, you take those four things, plus take your giftedness or your strengths. You ought to grow in that area. Whatever you're gifted in. For example, I'm gifted in communication, so I read a lot of books on communication. I'm, so whatever your strength is, you want, you want to, but, but your growth has to be focused on those four or five things in your life. Now, it doesn't mean you can't grow in any other thing. It just means your greatest return for growth will be if you stay in those sweet spots. And then you need to measure your growth. Because what gets measured gets done. And so every year, every year at the end of the year, I, I ask myself, how well did I do in this area? Am I getting better? Am I growing? Am I, am I, am I developing myself? How, how, can I, how can I measure that? And then how can I apply it what I'm learning? Because the moment that I learn something, the question I have is, how can I now apply that to my life, and how can I pass it on to the people that are on my team? That's how a leader thinks. How do I apply it to me? How do I pass it on to my people? That's why I'm so excited about you being here, because you all represent hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And, and everything that you're learning, you're saying, okay, here's how I apply this to me. This is how I work in my life. How do I apply it to the people in my, it, on my team? And that's what we're here for to help you do. We're, help you, we're here to help resource you to not only learn these principles yourself, but to learn it for, for, for your people. And then after I do all of that, I become intentional in the following things. Number one is I make growth my number one priority in my life. A day without growing is unacceptable to me. So I'm conscious of my need 24-7 to grow. And I'm constantly doing it. Number two, I look for growth opportunities in every situation. I not only make it my one, number one priority, but I ask myself, okay, what, what kind of growth opportunities are around me? Have I taken advantage of growth opportunities? growth conversations. Number three, I ask questions that will help me grow. <coughs> growth doesn't come looking for me. I have got to be proactive. So I ask questions all the time about growth. And, and I'm ask, if I'm with you, I'm going to ask you, what are you reading? Who are you talking to? What experiences has, has caused you to grow? I'm just asking you questions all the time. I'll drive you crazy with questions. The last time Jim Collins and I got together, we were speaking at the same convention out in Las Vegas. We were having lunch, and he sat down, and I sat down, and I kid you not. We sat down, and we looked at each other, and we both pulled out our card. <laughs> it was like, quick draw McGraw here. And we just leaned forward because we knew. We knew. We had an hour and 15 minutes. 
We were going to cut all the other stuff out. We ha he had questions asked me. I had questions asked him. And I threw out the first question. He said, that's not fair. He said, I have questions. I said, but I was first. <laughs> so I get the first question. And we just we went back and forth, back and forth, question, question. W why did we do that? Because Jim Collins and I know something. The only growing we're going to do isn't talking about where we've been, what we've done, who we know. Are you not tired of all that stuff? The only growing we're going to do is asking questions to the other person and learning from that person. Everything I've learned has become a result of a question, not a result of an answer. So you've got to constantly have this curious mind to, to ask questions. So I ask questions that will help me grow. I file what I learn every day. Every day I take what I'm learning and I file it in my iPhone. I put categories on it, and, and I, I put it in there, what I'm learning and, and how I'm growing. And I, I make sure as soon as I learn something from you, I put it in my iPhone immediately because the number one time waster is looking for things that are lost. And you know why you lost them? You didn't have a place to put them in the first place. So my systems give me the place to put things so I don't lose them so that I can go back to them and I can learn from them and I can grow from it. And then I pass on to others every day. I pass on to others what I'm learning. I can hardly wait to tell somebody else because every time I pass on to others what I've just learned, it reinforces the learning in me. And it allows me to kind of put that just a little stronger in my life, that impression just a, a little bit deeper in my life life. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up by, um, I, I love this, um, some parents of, a, of, a, of a, a little girl named Elizabeth Dodd, who was age nine, her parents would listen to my teachings. And they, they had video programs, and they just, they were always listening, reading my books. And so their nine-year-old daughter was just kind of hanging with them and, and picking up this stuff. And so this was written by Elizabeth Dodd, who's age nine. She said, John Maxwell says, always work on yourself more than others. He also says, always work on yourself before you work on others. I say, hey, he's right. Because if you work on others before yourself, you won't know what you're doing. <laughs> Elizabeth Dodd, age nine. I thought, the kid gets it. The kid gets it. I hope we get it today. I hope we get it. People know me for leadership, but I'm passionate for growth. And the reason I'm passionate for growth is if you're going to develop the leader within you, trust me, it's going to be because you want to get better every day. And what's so beautiful is if you'll do this in one year, to be honest with you, you won't recognize yourself. You'll have to reintroduce yourself to yourself. And you're going to have to say, I'm amazed how much you've grown in a year. What keeps me young is my passion to grow. I just don't have time to die. <laughs> and it's so good, I don't want to die. That's what I want for you. It's very true that we're always anxious to improve our circumstances. We're always anxious to, to fix the things around us. But so many times we're not anxious to improve ourselves and, and fix ourselves. And so the whole teaching of this is, is that when we start in life, we, you probably start off like I did, and that, that is with, with goal setting. And... Um, well, let me just tell you a story. Kirk Kampmeyer, when I was in my early 20s, asked me what my plan for growth was. And the bottom line is I didn't have a plan for growth. I didn't know that I was supposed to have a plan for growth. Um, he was the first one that kind of made me aware that, John, growth's not automatic. If you're going to grow, you have to grow intentionally. And uh, so I, I said, okay, I'm going to grow intentionally, but, but I didn't know how to grow. I mean, no one ever, you know... It's one thing to ask yourself if you have a growth plan, but I didn't have a growth plan. And I went to my friends and asked them if they had a growth plan, and none of them did. And so I, I desperately began to say, well, how do I grow myself? How do I develop myself? And so I brought something very personal to me today uh, because I'm holding in my hand the, the, where I started my growth plan. This is the dynamics of personal goal setting 
and its personal success planner, and it was by Paul Meyer, Success Motivation Institute. And this is where I started. This is, this is my first, I paid $799 for this, okay? And when I paid $799 for this, uh, that year I made, I, I, was, I started off as a, as a pass. I, that year I made $4,800. So this was huge. This was a, a lot of money, and, and I had to save up for it. I didn't have that kind of money. And so really six months of, of trying and saving, we, we finally got to this. And, and so this is where I started. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just very important. It's very special to me. But, but I started my personal growth plan with a goal-setting teaching. And it's got cassette tapes in here, and it's got workbooks, and I worked it through. And I really went through this personal growth plan three times. It, you know, the first time I, I got it, I threw it back to get some more, and it took me. So I went through it three times. But the reason I brought this with me today is, is for a couple reasons. One is is this is when people say, what's the best investment you've ever made in your life? The best investment I ever made in my life is right here. The $799 I paid, which was an awful lot of money for me, the $799 I paid has been worth millions of dollars for me. The return is incalculable. And, and the reason I say that is because I'm going to challenge you in a personal growth way to invest in yourself. In fact, if you wouldn't invest in yourself, why should anyone else invest in you? I'm always amazed at people who want me to scholarship them. Want to, you know, would you, well, you know, would you, could you kind of give me a, give me a, 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 a free lift? And my whole process, no, no. If, if you and I don't bet on ourselves, why should anyone else bet on us? The first bet that I ought to pay is, is on myself. And so this is my first kit, and, and so I brought it with you today to say that I literally started my growth, my whole growth life goal setting. And it isn't interesting, I'm talking to you about how do you and I lead or shift? How do we shift from, from being a, a, a goal setter to a person that just really works on growth? Because here's what, I, here's what I realized when I started in my growth plan. What I realized was this. The goals I achieved were not as great or as important as the growth that I was receiving in my life. That yes, I was setting goals and, and I was stretching towards those goals and it was a good thing, but, but it was, there was something happening in, in, internally to me that was more than, than places I wanted to go and, and numbers that I, I wanted to reach. And I, I, ex, I experienced two what I call growth changes that I want to give to you. Because I think that when you get on a growth journey that's intentional, you'll discover these same changes also. And the first one is very simple, and that is that I went from growth in everything to growth in essential things. When I started off my growth, I just said, well, I want to learn everything. And so I just read and, and studied and, and listened to tapes, and I just did everything I could to grow. And, and I, I was just grow, growth, grow. And, and one day it hit me that that was never going to get me to where I wanted to be that I had to go from trying to grow in every area and everything to, to grow, get, get, get essential. What are the main things that, that you just need to grow in? Now, for me, in my 20s, I came to the conclusion that if I could, um, if I could be successful in relationships, if I could be, become successful in training and equipping people, if I could have a, an incredible attitude that would help me be an overcomer, and if I could learn to lead and, and, and increase influence, if I could do those four things, relationships, equipping, attitude, leadership, if I could grow in those four areas, that I probably could be successful. And so I committed that these are the areas I'm going to grow in. And so I, I began to eliminate a lot of stuff so that I could grow in what I would call, for me, the main stuff. And I would say to each one of you in all of our sites and here locally that, that what you've got to do is when you start your growth plan, becoming intentional, you've got to ask yourself, what are the areas I'm going to grow in? You can't grow in everything. You don't even want to grow in everything. But you've but you got to grow in the essential things. For me, R-E-L, relationships, equipping, attitude, and leadership. And later on, I, I added communication because I knew that I would spend my life as a, a connector and a communicator. And because I am a person of faith, faith. And pretty much for 40 plus years, these have been my six essentials. Learning how to connect with people, learning how to train, equip others, having an attitude to help me overcome, learn how to lead and expand influence, learn how to 
communicate well, and, and, and then become the person of faith that, that I really want to become. This, this, has become. this is where I really spent my time. The second change I had in the area of growth was I went gro- from growth with a timeline to growth without a finish line. Now, this was a, an amazing experience that I had because when I started my growth journey, I, I, I thought in terms of, well, okay, uh, there'll be a, a, a finish line somewhere. There'll be a, a time when, when I've accomplished that. There'll be a time where I have achieved this. There'll be a time where I have arrived. And so I, so I, had, a, I had a timeline out there. And I heard Earl Nightingale say that if you spent an hour a day every day on a certain given subject, now that's back to the essentials, R-E-A-L, that stuff. If you spend an hour a day, every day, on a, on a certain given subject for five years, you could become an expert on that subject. Now that really excited me because at this time I'm falling in love with leadership. I'm, I'm buying into the idea everything rises and falls on leadership. And so here we go. I, I'm excited and I said, okay, I'm going to spend an hour a day, every day, for five years to become an expert on the subject of leadership. And that's what I did. Now, back then, there were not a lot of leadership books out. They were mainly management books. If you go back in the, well, if you go back in the 70s and 80s, you go into bookstores, you didn't find leadership books. You found management books. And, and so I read some management books, and it, it, it kind of got me going in the, in the right way. But I would talk to people that were leaders. I would try to do leadership experiences an hour every day. And, and every day, every week, as I would go through this process, I'd ask myself this question, how long will it take? Well, Earl Nightingale said it would take five years. Well, so, I, so I'm, now I'm, I, I'm not only reading and studying and learning and experiencing, guess what else I'm doing? I, I'm counting down. I, 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 I think I'm Mr. Cape Canaveral. Then I'm going, you know, five, you know, wow, four, you know, woo, three, and, I'm, and, and I'm, I can smell it. I, it's out there. I'm, I'm getting close. That, there's going to be some light in this tunnel pretty soon. And I was about halfway in this five-year run of countdown until something happened. It wasn't anything I read. It wasn't anything that somebody came and set aside me and, and mentored me on or, or kind of gave me some thoughts or advice. About halfway in this journey, the inside of me switched. I was receiving so much value from my personal growth. I was, rece- I, I was learning so much about leadership. I, I, was, I, I was growing so much internally that I stopped counting. And I I left the question, how long will it take? And I picked up the question, how far can I go? As we dive in today, the first one that we're really going to spend a lot of time on is hard for a lot of us. Let's just be honest. Where we go, man, we have to put aside our thoughts. We have to put aside our uh, inner uh, defense attorney. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I've been called that before in a different discussion, right? <laughs> and, and you have to go, man, okay, so I've got to have the understanding that there are other perspectives out there. There are other ways to do it. There are other things for us to go after, and we've got to be able to be teachable. And so I want to talk a, lot, a little bit about this word from your perspective. You obviously uh, just mentioned in the intro, the amount of growth you've had is, is because you're open to being teachable, but also you've let a lot of people that are teachable. Let's mm-hmm. let's unpack a little bit from your perspective for those that are listening, the 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 difference of what you see in those that are teachable or not teachable, the impact that this has had on your growth as a leader. Well, it's so interesting. So this is going to be fresh on my mind, but um, we just launched Maxwell Leadership uh, Vietnamese, and so now we have a certified team yeah. that only speak Vietnamese. We are launching corporate solutions. We're launching all of our personal growth solutions in the incredible country of Vietnam, yes. But really, we've expanded by looking at language groups. Mm. So Vietnamese people now are being served by everything that we're doing. So literally, right before coming down today to the studio to join you, I was teaching uh, about 175 of our new certified coaches in Vietnam. It is awesome. But it triggered me back because I'm teaching Zoom. And for some of them, I never saw anything but the top of their head. It triggers me back to the first time I traveled in Asia with John. And John said, now, Mark, when you're talking, don't think everybody's falling asleep. They're the best note takers, the best 
people that want to learn and take a note on everything you say. And of course, we know that podcast family, and I'm looking at you on YouTube. Thanks for watching us today. But we know podcast family that taking notes certainly isn't the only thing to indicate teachability, right? right? Right. I've seen a lot of people take a lot of notes, never pull it back out, and they were not, not any the better for it. But certainly being able to be in a posture of learning and taking notes, that's why we do the bonus resource every single week. And ask Jake and Chris, I stumble on it, being (laughs) able to say it almost every single week as well. But we do that because we want you to have a posture of learning. I've met a lot of people. You're talking to them. You're giving great thoughts are at least great experience. Sometimes my th- my sharing is not great thoughts, but it is always great experience because I've been traveling with John. Yeah. And I watch people never take a note. Mm. They never give an indication that they heard it. And then also, Chris, I want to tell you that I believe one of the one of the most sad waste of John Maxwell's time is we have people that pay literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to be mentored by John. They bring him in. I get to tag along a lot. They bring us in to mentor their people. And John's there, open access to ask the leadership guru of the world a question. And there's crickets. There's chirping. Mm. There's nothing. We end a call early that's been paid for. And I always go, wow, John Maxwell's experience, John Maxwell's words, John Maxwell's deal, and yet people are not going to ask questions. And I understand intimidation. I'm not going to ask a stupid question. I understand all that. And if you were on one of those calls, I'm not picking at you. But what I am saying, the worst question is the unasked one. The worst posture is the I know it all. So this concept of teachability is big for me, too. Yeah, I I think about that and— I often think about the Q&A. You just went right where I was going. And we'll ask John sometimes. We'll be like, hey, what what was it about that Q&A? Or what was it? And he'll say all the time, he'll be like, man, I just wish that they would have asked this question. And like John's already out there and he's already thinking about that. Um, You've been in this mode of being teachable. And um, I want to talk a little about something you hit on just a minute ago, where we say, and John talks about here in one of his points where he says, make your teachable moments count. Yeah. And John is big about this. As much as you are consuming, as much as you are learning, and for those that are listening and that are out there, I know it's true for me too. Like I consume a lot of information and I go through different podcasts and I'm in different conferences, I'm in different meetings and I'm taking notes. um, And then I, I don't do a really good job of coming back and saying, what are the two things? What are the three things? At the pace of which you travel, you learn, you grow, you want to be teachable. How do you do that? How do you really get specific about taking, being teachable, first of all, you've already explained that, but then then taking what you're learning and putting it into action? So you know what's interesting? I, I just started this. I've always had it. I've always had some kind of an exercise like this, so I'll explain it. But I just started something new that is really reaping great benefit uh, to my leadership in the area of learning something or applying something. A good friend of ours, Greg Steely, he, he, I think you may have even introduced me to him, uh, now leads our foundation uh, on the uh, next generation side. He told me about a discipline that he got a long time ago. I think it's with his wife, but I can't remember all this. But he had a discipline that every evening he'd come up with three takeaways of the day. And again, mm. I think he would share it with um, with Monica. Monica yeah. And uh, and he said it just was kind of this accountability. And I, from the accountability standpoint, great. But what really triggered me is am I distilling down what is my greatest takeaways at the end of every evening? And I do a great job of planning and reflecting. It is a discipline in my life. Yes. But I was not disciplining on my takeaways. I was disciplining on what did I accomplish? Well, now that I have been doing this for about, uh, I think about three months, two and a half months maybe, now that I'm doing this, it's incredibly exciting at the end of the in, in the evening. I can't wait to, to get and write in my three, journal and yeah. pull those things out. But here's what I do. On the weekend, you betcha, I am pulling that out and then deciding what my top five takeaways from the last seven days is. Mm-hmm. And then my Sunday takeaway is what I am putting in action already from my takeaways. Yeah. And that accountability That's is good. very important. I have done something. I've talked about it on the podcast for, for many times. Um, I do something called a life plan. At the end of the year, I reflect the previous year's plan and put a plan together for the next year. 
it's a powerful experience. I've had some of the greatest experiences, but the greatest effectiveness of that is when once a month, once a quarter, I pull it back Check out, out. Yeah. and make sure how I'm applying it. Yeah, that's good. I love that because I think in the world of content, there's so much content out there. Let's make sure that we are being very, very intentional. I love the example you just gave that that you learned from Greg, right? And then you distill it from that big number down to five. And then how is that going to be part of what I do the next week? I agree. And I love when he talks about having a hunger that makes us stretch. And when you hear someone in their 70s talking about having a hunger, it's inspiring to me to want to continue to have a hunger all the way through. And I love the word that he kicks off this podcast with and when he talks about the vitality that growth brings, because I don't think we tend to think, well, maybe it's just me, <laughs> but yeah. I don't think we think of vitality in your seventies. I mean, what are we, what are we kind of program to think of you hit a certain age, 62, 65, whatever it is that you retire, but vitality in your seventies of growing still, that just reshapes our brain to think we never want to be someone who stops growing, certainly as our mentor. And he has given us three words that are essentials for growth. And uh, we want to kick it off with confidence. And I've got a, a question about you and a question about your team when it comes to down to confidence. And at this stage in your personal leadership journey, Mark, what are you learning personally about confidence right where you're at today in your leadership journey? Well, I think it's as John talked about today is the importance of confidence. A great leader without confidence doesn't do great things. In fact, it's the it's when we lose our confidence that we tend up. John talks often, Tracy, you've heard him say this, podcast family, you've heard him say this. He says, I'm one step away from stupid. And uh, aren't we all? I mean, isn't that true? All of us are sitting here. Oh, man, yes, I am one podcast away from stupid. I'm just one channel of listening to the wrong podcast that's going to send me on a wild goose chase. We're one we're one decision away from stupid. Um I think when we lose our confidence, we edge closer to that step. Because we begin scrambling, we lose our way, we lose our sense of certainty, and then we begin to grasp and we begin to um try to find something that will help us gain our confidence back. And I've just watched a lot of people, you've heard of liquid courage, referred to people that over drink and they get a lot more confident when they're when they're inebriated. And, and it's true, I've seen them, I've seen liquid courage work. But I'm gonna tell you that there is a confidence factor that when a leader knows when a communicator knows that they have something to share, it makes them more believable. It makes them more, um, it, it makes people follow them better. I, I, um, I, so I distill it down to a great question and just go, what am I learning? And it is the significance of confidence. I remember, I remember when I first started communicating on John's stage, did a lot of communication many, many years ago, but I began communicating on John's stage and I'm going, that's a big microphone to hold, Tracy. You've held that microphone before. That's a big spotlight to stand in. That's big shoes to fill. And I can remember walking into those rooms, walking on those stages, my knees trembling, and my content wasn't as bad as it sounded because of confidence. I remember the other day I, I was speaking at something, and I don't think my com content was that good, to be honest with you, but people raved about the way I said what I said because confidence is contagious. And so I would I would tell you that confidence is contagious, confidence is imperative, and yet confidence can be lost in difficult times when nothing's changed except the situations around you that are beyond your control. Can you keep confidence? even when circumstances are beyond your control. And it is a hard handle. It's a hard thing to hold on to when things are spiraling out of control. 
And so what do you do? The follow-up question before I get to your team confidence question is what are some things that you do to maintain that confidence when you are on John's stage and you're holding his microphone and and it's a if or a situation where it feels spiraling out of control? What is it that keeps you anchored in confidence when you feel a little shaky? Uh, the first thing that I've got to say is you borrow somebody else's confidence. I've looked at people often that's doing something for the first time and I go, hey, I have enough confidence for the both of you. Borrow mine. You're going to be fine. There is just this figurative and yet literal hand on the shoulder that just says, hey, borrow mine. It's going to be fine. Now, when you tell somebody that to do something that's very hard for them, that they don't have confidence in, and you say, borrow mine, you've got to circle back and tell them what you enjoyed and why you have the confidence. Because they're just going to think you're giving them a pep rally before you jump on stage or before you jump into a leadership environment. There is a a lot of intentionality has got to be put into extending somebody borrowed belief. And when you but when you can do that, that's the biggest take, uh, the biggest thing that I do uh, to help myself with confidence or to help others. The second thing that I would say, though, Tracy, is um, I think it's I think it's a little bit of what John said here when he says confidence stimulates creativity that discovers answers. I'm always looking for answers. It's back to that hunger that you mentioned at the top of the show. I'm always hungry for answers, for lessons, for something to take away. And I've discovered that even when I don't do well, speaking, whatever I'm doing, when I don't do well, if I can walk away with a takeaway, all is well in my world. Because the win is in getting an answer that will make me better down the road. I think that is so great. So that ties into two things. John said, a confident leader gives people confidence. So that is lending your confidence to someone else and getting that from someone else when you feel a little shaky. But what is key there is rather than being in a moment where you walk off stage or you leave a presentation or you leave a moment where you feel a little shaky and instead of circling the drain and beating yourself up with negative thoughts and, oh, I just blew that, that was terrible, The flip is if you can train your brain as a leader to instead of going negative and going down and beating yourself up, instead remaining hungry for growth. How can I get better? Tell me where I could have done better. If you stay in that hungry space, you're going to grow forward. You're going to fail forward to the next time and you'll be able to do it better rather than just shutting down. And I think that's a key. That hunger is a huge piece of growing forward and not just going downward, looking down and just seeing where you missed the mark. I think that's a huge piece of it. And it leads right to my question about your team. Is confidence something that you attempt? I know you said that you try to lend your confidence to someone else, but if you have a team member or several team members that struggle with confidence, is that something that you attempt to grow in your team Or is, you know, if if you've got, I've had team members before who were so capable, but they struggled with confidence and that can be a real game changer. And at what point do you stop attempting to grow it in them? Or is it something that you attempt at all? Is this something that you can grow? Well, as a leader believing in somebody, if you've lost confidence in them and you feel like you have taught them all the confidence that they got, I think there's two There's two major flags that I see in that. Number one, you can't trust somebody that you don't have confidence in. You can't. If you don't, if you've lost your confidence in somebody, there's no way they're going to gain confidence if you've lost confidence. So um, then the question is, how do you help them build the trust slash confidence back up in your working relationship? So the first thing that I would say is, is you you can never lose confidence in someone. You've got to continue. If you keep them empowered in a position, you've got to keep believing and you got to keep loaning. That's called leadership. The second thing that I would say is there is a thin line, isn't there, between confidence and being comfortable. We get confident often in the predictability and then it's not good because growth guarantees change. 
The only way, the only way to guarantee success tomorrow or better tomorrow is growth today, and growth is going to have change. So if our confidence really is being comfortable, we're not stretching that teammate enough. So I think instilling and providing borrowed confidence to teammates is a infinite job of a leader. You've got to constantly be doing that because the day you're not believing in them, you got a problem. The day that you believe that you don't have to share with them anymore because they're comf- comfortable or confident, then probably chances are you've allowed them to get comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's really good. Okay, let's move on to number two, the second essential, which would be courage. And he kicks it off by saying that courage is the the willingness to let go of the familiar. And I would believe that's what stops a lot of people is the willingness to let go of the familiar. You know, when it makes me think of on the playground, when you're on the monkey bars and you're, you can't move on until you let go of the bar before you reach for that next bar. And so why do you think in your opinion, in your experience, in what you've seen with the teams that you've led, Why do you think it is so difficult for a leader to let go of the familiar? And then how do you guide a leader? Maybe it's even in yourself to to know when it's time to let go versus when do you say when do you know how to just call it versus when do you know when to hang on just a little bit more because you're just around the corner from a breakthrough? You know, so many times people stop just when they were just about to have a breakthrough. They let they stop too soon. So when do you know when it's too soon to let go? And when do you know when to hang on just a little bit longer because a breakthrough is about to happen? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it speaks to the certainty that we want from leadership. We want leaders to say, after three months, after three attempts, after three opportunities, boom, you're going to have it. And yet courage doesn't work that way. In fact, I would tell you this. Using courage and 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 uh, and staying in the game is going to take you longer than you thought, and it's going to cost you more than you thought. So, if you want to build a plan around around when that person has the courage uh, to to move forward, add some time to it. Whatever you think it is, add some time to it. And by the way, probably gonna have to add some more time to it because. It's true that while everyone wants certainty, we can't offer certainty. There are some times we just simply don't know. What we can do is offer clarity of the next step. We can say that there is a great next step, but I don't know the final step. And here's what I have found, Tracy, is in training and helping people lead and lead from a place of courage. I have found that the process, the personal process that people go through to establish courage is how courage is established, not some three steps in a in an assignment. It's really the act of staying the course and staying in there longer than you thought and not giving up when you felt like giving up. I've got so many leaders right now that is speaking into me on the power of the journey and the power of the the discipline and the tenacity in the journey. They don't give me the solutions that said after 18 months for me, it'll be 20 months for you. And they they never give that. They give words like tenacity, stay in the course, being committed, staying longer than you thought, paying more than you thought. And uh, I, I think that's the answer is, are you so committed to it that you are going to stay the course with great courage to see it through? I heard a lot of action words in there. I think a lot of people get stalled out and they freeze and they wait while they're waiting for the breakthrough. But the action words that I heard there was the process, the next step, discipline, tenacity, committing, paying more, because it's right in line with John's point where he says life expands or shrinks in proportion to your courage. Courage is in in motion. It's not 
freezing. For those of you who can't see me in, in, in YouTube, I'm frozen on screen, <laughs> but it's not, I think we can, part of knowing that you're being courageous is that you're in action, you're moving, you're still taking steps forward. And that's how life is expanding to see, should you be taking that next step? So that is probably going to help to know uh, where you're, if you're ready for the decision making step, which is number three. And I love this, uh, this point, this essential that John talks about decision making. And I, I love this because it is a life changer. It really is the summary of a life that John has lived and continues to live. And it is really a guide for all of us. These are a guide in five areas that have formed really who John is, decisions that make up the man, the human being that is John, because really who we are is made up of a bunch of decisions that we've made over and over and over again, and not per that we're perfect, but decisions that are in line with what we believe. And so he talks about five decisions that he formed in his life. He titled them, he titled them ministry, personal growth, partnership, relationship and leadership decisions. Now, I don't think that we all need to be, to give those same exact titles. Those make sense for John's brain. Um, and, but I think that they are important because they're in line with who he is as a human, as a leader in all aspects of his life. And so I'm curious, Mark, we chatted a little bit before we, we were rolling just to make sure that I didn't want to catch you off guard, but can you share some of, I mean, you are a, life, a man who lives a very intentional life, a life that I respect. You're somebody who's, as your friend, as somebody who works closely with you, I can say to our podcast listeners, you're somebody uh, who is the same in, in private, in a private conversation that you are in public. And I admire you greatly as a friend and as a mentor. And if you could share some of the processes, I'm sure that you haven't, you know, you're, you're in your early fifties. You have not early, early fifties. Early fifties. <laughs> early. Can you share some of your, the processes and decisions? So, um, so that our listeners can kind of hear what are the decisions that you, Mark Cole have made that make up you as a human being. Yeah, so it's interesting because so many of them, Tracy is John's, and uh, a product of that, that there's two reasons for that, and probably many of our podcast listeners that listen to John, you know, he finished with this rallying cry, you are my legs to my legacy, help me carry the legacy. I feel that same way about all of our podcast family. Yeah. You guys are carrying the baton forward. You're carrying the ball forward. And, I, and I'm extremely grateful for that. So much like many of you, I've been so influenced and shaped by John that maybe I would have had different words 25 years ago, but it would fit under these categories. So I'm probably using the categories because what was in me now sounds right in the way that John's explained it. The other thing that I would tell you is I don't think it's an accident that John felt like that I was somebody he wanted to he wanted to ride off in the sunset with. I think there is a shared sense of confidence, courage, decision making that he and I have. So again, because of those two things, I don't think it's any accident. But let me give you my five. Um, and the fifth one that I have cracks me up because I love partnerships, but I didn't include partnership in mine. And John loves my fifth one, so I I, I don't think. It would not be in his top five. So anyway, here's they are. One, one is leadership. I have made a decision that I believe everything rises and falls on leadership. What that means is, is when things are going awry, when things are going sideways in my, in my team, in my company, my first question is always, what could I have done? What should I do different to make this better? I never look at somebody else. I don't look at the excuse or play the blame game. I always look, number one, at me because everything rises and falls on leadership. Number two, for me, is significance. Now, John used ministry. I use significance. I believe life is absolutely about others, adding value to others. My third one is relationship. I told you a little bit of this, Tracy. Forgive me um, if for some of you that don't quite have this frame of reference, but um my dad used to always say, Mark, the only thing you can take to heaven with, the only thing that's going to outlast is going to be people. 
And um, and so I just, from an early, early age, I learned the power of relationships. I would probably put John's decision of partnerships under relationships, to be honest with you. And then I, too, have always been super passionate about personal growth. I'm just, I'm incredibly passionate about it. It went to the next level being on John's team. And, I, and so I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, being on John's team. The final one that I would put, and this is an important one because it was tested, is faith. I made the I made the faith decision. And John says often, a vision that has not been tested cannot be trusted. And I would say a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. Many of us grew up in love with our parents' God or our parents' faith. And we never really developed that intentional walk. And what happened to me at 30 is I had to really reconcile, was I going to continue choosing faith or was I going to let the disappointing faith of others to drive me from a faith of my own? And fortunately, because of the goodness of God, not anything on me, I chose the former. My The disappointment of somebody else's faith drove me to get a faith of my own, and I'm extremely grateful for that. So it's a very personal one to me. It doesn't have to be everybody else's, but it's a, it's a decision. And so I gauge myself, I talk to myself, I watch myself based off of that decision to really make faith a part of my life. Well, thank you for sharing those five with us. And my action step to our podcast listeners is this. I don't know where you are at in your life. Uh, You might be just beginning or you might be in the stage where Mark and I are at or you might be where John is. But I encourage you to look back or look forward and make some decisions for your own. The action step for you is after you listen to this podcast, is maybe using the model of those Mark 5 or John's 5, because Mark Mark kind of encapsulates John's uh, 5, kind of consolidates some of them, uses different words, different language. But come up, begin today to make some decisions yourself of what you want those 5 or 6 or 3, whatever it is that you want your life to stand for, that makes up and describes you as a human. So that as you make decisions in your life, that they can fall under those categories to say, sometimes we make decisions in our life that you think, what should I do? And when you have to, when you have pre-decided things that you want your life to stand for, it's easy because you run it through that litmus test of what you've already decided for yourself. And then I want you to come back and share it with us, whether it's on our Instagram, Maxwell Leadership Instagram page or our podcast uh, notes down below, or if you come to YouTube and we would love to see, and I know I always go through and look at what you've written to us and try to comment and like what you've done, but come back and share with us what they are. We would love to know what they are. Give us some feedback because we would love to know what your five are as you are creating the legacy, not just John's legacy, but your own legacy. It's funny. You mentioned listener comments. I always like to wrap Tracy with a listener comment and uh, so this this week's comes from JJ. He listens to the podcast, How Leaders Make the Tough Call. I remember that one uh, specifically. And so uh, JJ, listening to that, will include that in the show notes, obviously. But here's what JJ said. He said, Tracy, he's talking to you. He said, Tracy, you've always got the best questions for Mark to get him to open up. And uh, I, I, let me go ahead and say what he said. He said, to get him to open up, truly a big part of your gifting. And so, Tracy, I do agree. You, and JJ, thank you for the comments. I think what JJ is saying is, is you get me to confess all of my bad leadership stuff with your questions. Improving yourself is the first step of improving everything else in your life. And here's what I, here's what I learned that the goals that I achieved were not as important as the growth that I received. That goals help me do better, but growth helps me be better. And if you, you don't go to the next level, you grow to the next level. If you go to the next level, you may not have the competency to continue growing. 
But anytime you grow to the next level, it is a natural organic life that, you, that allows you to keep going. You, you, you want to grow to where you're going, not go without that growth. Because growth on the inside feeds growth on the outside. All of your goals will be reached during that growth process. So when I became growth-oriented, I made two major changes, okay? And, and this is going to be really practical for you. Because when I said, okay, I'm, I'm not, I, I, now, by the way, I, I, I've reached a lot of goals, but I don't set goals. I'm passionate about growth. And so when, 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 I, when I started transferring from a goal person to a growth person, there's something I immediately discovered, and that was, and I'm going to give the, there were two changes I made. Number, the first change is this. I changed from growth in everything to growth in essential things. In other words, the goal is not to get you to know everything and grow in every area. The goal is for you to grow in the what I've been calling today the everyday essentials. In the beginning of my growth, I was trying to learn everything. And I was realizing that learning everything isn't going to help me at all. And a whole bunch of stuff that I'm learning is not going to contribute at all to my success or significance in life. So I, I began to understand that I was going to have to narrow down the areas that I grew in. I had to forget about knowing everything, and I had to focus on knowing the essential things. Now, this took me a considerable amount of time. It's not going to take me much time to teach it to you, but this took me 18 months because I kept trying out different things. And is this essential for my success? And, and, and I would discover, well, no, it's not. It's good, but it's not essential. So I'd put it aside. And, and so what, what took me 18 months to discover, I'm going to give it to you now, because we're going to sp spend the rest of our time on five things. But the five things we're going to spend the, mo the rest of our time on, I'm going to promise you that's all the return that you need to be successful in life and significant will be given to you through these five areas. They're the, they're the five essentials. You, you just, I mean, these aren't like things that you should get to someday or perhaps try out sometime. I've got it, I've got it figured out. These are the essentials. And, and you just take the word clear, C-L-E-A-R. Because each letter represents a different word. The letter C is communication. The L is leadership. The E is equipping. The A is attitude. And the R is relationships. If you can excel in those five areas, you will excel in any business that you ever engage in. That's a fact. So the first change I made was, I'm not going to grow in everything. I'm just going to grow in the essential things. And by the way, if we were in Q&A, you would find that I don't do what you do most of your days. Most of the things that you do every day, I never do. Not, not because they're wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's just not in my essentials. And if I'm doing something that's not essential, it's not going to give me the return I want. Trust me, it's not wrong. It's, it's even good. It's just not essential. The second change I made with this growth mindset is I started to have growth with a timeline. I, 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 I had, okay, I had growth with a timeline and I changed it to growth without a finish line. I took the timeline out of my growth system. Because in the beginning, everything I did, I'd say, okay, uh, you know, I'll get this done at this certain time. And, and I was putting deadlines and timelines on my growth. Well, let me tell you where it started. It started when I heard um, Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale said something one time. I was in my 20s. He said, if you'll spend one hour a day every day 
on one subject and only one subject. She says, and now every day on that subject, in five years, you'll become an expert on the subject. And I was at that time very passionate about leadership because I had come to the conclusion everything rises and falls on leadership. And so I'm 20, what would I be? I was probably 26. And when Earl Nightingale said, if I spend one hour a day, every day on one subject for five years, I'd be an expert on it. I said, I'm going to do that with leadership. And that's exactly what I did. Every day, one hour. Read leadership, talk to leaders, ask leadership questions, do leadership projects every day. And now leadership, leadership, leadership. And Earl Nightingale said, five years, I could be an expert. Five years. Wow. So I started my growth journey like Cape Canaveral. I did a countdown. Five, four, three. I'm going to blast off. I'm going to be a leader, an expert leader. Halfway through the five years, halfway through the countdown, and, and, and every day I'd say, how long will it take? Well, how long will it take? Well, Earl said five years. Oh, how long will it take? Five. I'm in my second year, four years. How, how long will it take? How long will it take? And halfway through that five years, I began to change. And I began to change because I was practicing leadership on a daily basis, and I was learning to lead, and I was becoming a better leader, and more people were joining my team, and I was starting to have leadership success, and the thrill of growth, the joy of seeing where I was and now where I am, the understanding now that if I was intentional in my personal growth, my life would get wonderfully better, and, and feeling the exhilaration of, of growing and learning and improving about halfway through that five years, how long will it take? How long will it take? How long will it take? One day I said, I'm never going to ask that question again because I'm growing. I'm getting better. In fact, I changed the question from how long will it take to how far can I go? How far can I go? And by the way, I was asking that question at 26. Can I tell you something? At 76, I'm still asking that question. How, how far can I go? I, 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 have, I have no idea. I, I'm not even there. I'm not even close to being there. Oh, my gosh. I understand my father, who worked full-time up through the age of 95, when we were having lunch one day at 92, and he's looking at me, he's 92, and he said, son, he said, I've been thinking about my life, and he said, I believe my greatest days are still ahead. He's 92. My greatest days are still ahead. Some people are 22 and can't say that. And, I, I, and when I started writing books, I thought, I wonder when, when there will be a day that I'll, I'll not be creative. And, and, you know, I wonder when there's be a day when I sit down. I write, by, I write with a uh, four-color pen on a legal pad. I write all my books out by hand. And, and I said, I wonder if there'll be a day when I'll sit down and there, there's just nothing there. And, and what I've discovered is it's never happened, and the, and the list gets longer of things I want to write. You see, when you live in this growth world, in this creative world, when you're in the game every day, you never run out of fuel. In fact, you don't understand it. The more you give, the more you receive. And, and, and there's, you know, it, there's just like this abundance that begins to happen. And now I'm looking at it, and I've got more books to write than I've ever had to write. And I think, I may have to live to be 200. I don't know what's going to happen. You understand? But one of the books I'm going to write is going to be entitled, Is There a Finish Line? It's going to be a great book. I wouldn't write anything else. Is there a finish line? And it's going to be a question because for most people, the answer is yes. For most people, there's a finish line. In this business right here, when people sometimes they make enough money to, to take care of their needs, they say, well, this is all I wanted. This is all I need. And so they just stopped. Sometimes people say, well, at this age, I think I'll retire. I, I don't know. So for most people, they have a finished line. I have none. I have none. Because here's what I know about a self-imposed finish line. And by the way, any finish line that you have, 
you put it there. So don't look at me. You put it there. There was some time in your life you said, at, at that age, I'm, I'm done. When I get that much money, I'm done. Mm, 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 mm. Let me say this. You perhaps don't know this, but if you have a superimposed finish line, self-imposed, when you cross that line, you're finished. What part of that do you not understand? How is it with all the things that you run with your five pillar, with your five pillars and your three subcategories, making it 15 points um, with the children in your life, the large business that you run, the travel that you do, how do you keep focused on these? Do you have an accountability partner? Do you have someone who checks in with you? Is there somebody who that you kind of that holds you accountable to make sure that you, that you're keeping the main things, the main things? Yeah, so absolutely, without a doubt, the my partner in my priorities, my partner in my schedule, my car, partner in travel and juggling is Kimberly Wetzel. She's been on John and my team for uh, about 19 years now. She's been my executive partner, my executive assistant for uh, about 12 years. And when I get finished with my yearly year in review, the first thing that I do is I call in my wife. She is the chairman of my executive advisor council. My personal advisory council is chaired by my wife, Stephanie. Stephanie, do you like the plan? Do you think the plan will make us better? Do you think the plan is something that we can buy in together as a couple? She's my first meeting. She comes and she she does not rubber stamp it. Let's be really clear. She picks it apart and she also assesses how I did the year before. But that's my first meeting. My second meeting is with Kimberly. Kimberly, this is what Stephanie and I agreed is the plan. This is what we think the plan is going to look like. These are the moments in my schedule that needs to be protected. And she begins to put it into play. And she is the executor. She is the execution element of my life plan, making sure that it's on port. She's accountability. She's making sure that it happens. Now, I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but here's what I will tell you. John talked about this focus thing. I decided years ago that people spend, Stephanie and I spent 18 months building the home that we're living in now. And we tweaked it and we cared about paint colors and we decided floor covering. We decided shrubs. We decided all of that stuff. But forget homes, because those are pretty complicated. And by the way, Stephanie and I stayed married during building a home together. Congrats. Kudos to us. Yeah. And then, and then, but you have people that spend hours, days, months planning their family vacation. And yet they give no thought to the life they want to live. They put no intentionality into what they want to be imported in their life. And so I believe that focus on a better you. That's why I made this digital products every day with purpose available to you for a low, low $49. Because I believe that your intentionality around your life should be the one thing you focus on this entire year. It should be the focus. I'm very influenced by a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And every, he challenges us to get one thing to focus on in the sweet spot of our day, which for me is the morning, and focus on that one thing. So how do I run all of these things and stay focused on personal growth? Tracy, every day of the week, I have a one thing that I focus in the four-hour sweet spot of my day. And everything else gets put on hold and I focus on that. It could be a business initiative. It could be a family need that we have to focus on. But the, every day, so one thing is going to get four hours of my undivided focus to make sure that it works. And I get up pretty early. So my one thing, four hour segment is quite early. Uh, a lot of times I'm done with my one thing for four hours before some people are getting up in the morning. God's just blessed me with some DNA from my mom that allows me to do that. But get focused and put something into practice. And for all of us at the beginning of this, you need to go do every day, of pur every day with purpose uh, for that incredible deal that we put out there for our podcast listeners.
Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. 